Pick the worst periods of Russian history and you'll find echoes of them in the present day. Whether they be the economic and mafia chaos of the 90s, the privations and repressions of the Soviet period. And several stories from the last week exemplify this devolution of Russia into the worst versions of itself from the past. The arrest of an American journalist, the defection of a former Kremlin security officer, and a spectacular assassination, theatrical assassination of the political extremist in St. Petersburg. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. Our material is now available on popular podcasting platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Today I'm speaking to David Satter, journalist and historian with unique insights into how the defamation and repression of the past is having terrible consequences for present day Russia. David has written extensively about Russia and the Soviet Union, especially the decline and fall of the USSR and rise of post-Soviet Russia. David became the first American journalist to be expelled from Russia since the Cold War in December 2013. This was perhaps not surprising, given that his books have covered topics such as the FSB's role in the apartment bombings that brought Putin to power. From 1976 to 1982, David was the Moscow correspondent of the Financial Times and then became a special correspondent on Soviet affairs for the Wall Street Journal. He is currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a fellow of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He is the author of several books which I highly advise you to read as they are essential reading to help understanding the origins of the current crisis and they are brilliantly named as well. It was a long time ago and it never happened anyway. Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State, and from my mind, the best one, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep. And that's never been more apposite as it is for Russia today. David, welcome back to the channel for the third time. Glad to be with you. Well, let's jump straight into lawlessness and the Western journalist uh, Evan uh, Gershkovich has been detained um, what do you think are the motivations and what is the quid pro quo that Russia is looking for by detaining this high profile journalist? I'm not sure if they're looking for uh, something in exchange right now, although that that uh, will eventually be uh, discussed, I presume. I think that this is part of a general tightening. Uh, this is a message to both journalists and to the Russian population that uh, they're going to clamp down on the circulation of any type of information that can undermine them or undermine uh, the war effort as they understand it. Uh, I doubt, of course, we don't know the details. I doubt that Evan Gershkovich uh, did anything that was uh, unusual by the standards of reporting in Russia uh, in previous years. Uh, what's changed is the criteria for arrest. The espionage statute is uh, allow in Russia allows them to to arrest anybody for anything. Practically, it says anyone who furnishes uh, information harmful to national security to a foreign power. A conversation with a person on a street uh, who says that. Uh, you know, people are losing faith in Putin could fall under that category. So uh, I think that they want, they've, they've already intimidated people pretty thoroughly. Uh, and I think they want to make it clear uh, that uh, they are not, that they are not free to talk to Western correspondents. And this is a way of demonstrating it. So is this a signal for the local population or a as we had with Skripal and others, maybe there's multiple messages being delivered in these actions. So clearly this is uh, a warning to, to Russians not to communicate with the media of which many are already wary to do so, but it's also a message to the Western press and the few uh, of uh, Western reporters who are still actually reporting out of, of Russia. You know, many have been sort of uh, banned or not had their visas renewed. Um, is it also a warning to the uh, to the world's press? Yes, of course. I mean, it's a way of telling those who who remain in in Moscow, and it's a dwindling band uh, that uh, their job is simply to 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 recycle official information and that they that they should not interest themselves 
in what's really going on and should not seek independent sources of information. And I presume that those journalists who have decided to stay after this uh, have assimilated that message. Is there any similarity? Because, of course, you pushed some very specific buttons uh, with with the regime there. You know, you looked into the rise of Putin, how he got to power. And these are areas which it's been made very clear to Russian journalists for many years are completely off topic. So you pushed some very specific buttons, which led to your expulsion from, from Russia. Are there any parallels, do you think, between your case and those of Evan? Uh, well, you know, I I was in Russia at, during a different period. I haven't been back uh, since being banned in 2013. It's almost 10 years. In that time, the information environment has changed considerably. In 2013, the Russian authorities were attempting to create the impression that Russia was a free and democratic society, that it was a place uh, where uh, Western journalists could operate without fear of expulsion. In fact, before I was expelled, uh, they often uh, made quite quite a, a point of the fact that no American correspondent had been expelled from Russia since uh, the end of the Cold War. And in, I was told that they even pointed to me as an example of just how much they're willing to tolerate. Well, their toleration broke uh, in uh, uh December 2013, when the Maidan revolt in Ukraine demonstrated the fact that uh, uh, the regime, that regimes of that type are not, are not inherently stable, and they can be overthrown, they can be challenged. And so I became a, le a luxury they no longer wanted to tolerate. But, uh, but at that time, it took something pretty extraordinary to get expelled. I mean, you had to get to go into the most sensitive questions, and uh, the most the the question of questions, of course, is how Putin came to power. This is and our our Western uh, uh, governments were blind uh, to the implications of the facts that were coming out of Russia at that time, and wanted to close their eyes and pretend as if nothing was going on and nothing. Nothing was happening. There was no cause for concern. So I was against that background pretty much of an exception. Now, I think in the case of Evan uh, Gershkovich, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, there's uh, I, he he was doing things, I presume, that were 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 perfectly acceptable, certainly before the war began, broke out and even for the first couple of months. But, uh, you know, as the war has gone uh, more and more badly for the uh, for the Russians and for the for the regime, they have become uh, more and more determined to choke off information, and uh, you know he just didn't get the message in time, uh, and as a result, uh, you know they can you know their their criteria shift uh, depending on their political needs, not on the the law doesn't restrain them in any way. And so what was what was tolerated one day uh, and uh, treated as uh, as quite normal, uh, the next day might uh, be a criminal offense. And that kind of lawless system also has a certain amount of capriciousness, doesn't it? So the punishment meted out to one person is not necessarily how another is going to be treated, but it's almost like that sort of terroristic terroristic. Uh, kind of uh, approach you you don't know and you don't necessarily know the rules the criteria uh, upon which that punishment is based yes and that makes people cautious of course the 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 the, the classic example were the 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 stalin era purges in which no one could be sure what it was that that uh, would incriminate them in the eyes of the authorities and as a result the 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 social interaction in the country was completely paralyzed. Uh, in this situation, there's a return of fear, and uh, of course, we did. There's no, there isn't the kind of mass repression and mass uh, terror that existed during the Stalin period. But people people know that that's a potential in Russia, particularly with a, a leader who came out of the KGB, and. Uh, they are they they have become very cautious 
very cautious indeed what they say on the phone, what they put on social media, what they say to their friends, what they say over the telephone. I've, I, I myself, I'm in touch with people in Russia. I'm experiencing this all the time, that it's uh, uh, not safe to say certain things, not because of my situation, but because of theirs. And you found people are reticent, refusing perhaps even to speak, or afraid about speaking on telephones in particular, which of course can be can be bugged. Oh, very much so. Well, they're 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 willing to speak up to a point. Uh, it, it hasn't gotten that far, but 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 as we as we see in the case of Evan, uh, uh, the rules are shifting. They can change. Even that can be uh, considered to be a violation of of of, of some some type of uh, 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 law. And pe- pe- people understanding the potential of of the regime uh, prefer to err on the side of caution, which is very understandable. Those that are free thinking are still in the country and uh, are unhappy about what's going on. And he finds himself in a sort of Kafkaesque, I would imagine, sort of judicial process where the lawlessness of being charged for a supposed crime that will also be paralleled by the conditions you might end up in or the regime, penal regime you might end up in, um, which, again, uh, could uh, perhaps not resemble, uh, you know, something you'd find in, in, in a Western prison. We read of Navalny's treatment, which is, you know, bordering on on torture. Um Do we know whether they're going to potentially do the same with Evan or is he perhaps going to be treated differently? Hard to say. Hard to say. In the past, foreigners were treated differently uh, simply because there was an expectation they would one day get out and speak about what happened to them. Uh, They were of potential use in trades for people who were arrested for real crimes. Uh, in the West. But uh, this is a new era. What's going to happen now? He's in the Lafortif prison. Oh, uh, and uh, there are there, 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 there's certainly the potential for mistreatment there without a doubt. Well, we recently this comes off the back of the ICC uh, sort of ruling. Now, the likelihood of Putin being uh, arrested, of course, is, is, is low. The likelihood of him going to a territory where he could be arrested is low. Do you think that there may be some linkage between uh, what's happening to this journalist and the efforts of the international community to hold Russia's regime to account? I, I don't think there's a direct tie. I think that what we're dealing with is just a tightening up of uh access to information Uh, and one way to do that is to intimidate the foreign journalists uh, and uh, by implication intimidate all those who associate with them or or wish to give them information it's important to bear in mind that the journalists in moscow if they spoke russian or were in a position to socialize with people and and part of being uh, a, a good correspondent is to, to understand the the temper of the society, which you get from 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 all manner of meetings with people. It's not just a question of having a formal interview. Uh, I think that 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 many Russians will be increasingly reluctant to uh, in, involve themselves in any kind of social interchanges with uh, Western correspondents in light of this. And that that further uh, narrows the impressions and the knowledge that a correspondent needs in order to make sense of the situation. You don't want to be in a position where, like during the Soviet period, uh, correspondents were expected simply to regurgitate official information, and most and for, for, uh, to great de- a great extent, uh, that's what they did. And uh, that, that I think that's the irony of this situation. I mean, all that I've read about this particular correspondent, um, he seems to have really immersed himself in Russian life. As you say, he's a, a fluent uh, Russian speaker with a wide social circle, well traveled, well read, but he genuinely 
as as many Russianists do. He seems to have a, a sort of deep regard or love for 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 Russian literature and history. And it's especially cruel, isn't it, that uh, you know he wasn't just doing a job, as you say, superficially. He's someone who really tried to get to grips with that society, and then it's turned around and uh, meted out this this treatment to him. Well, I mean, it would be. I mean, generally speaking, the over the years, the the journalists who uh, tried to uh, probe deeper and uh, tried to get at the the real uh, essence of the situation were those who actually had a great deal of affection for the country, and you couldn't do it otherwise because uh, the people who can give you that that deeper understanding are Russians. Uh, you don't get it from your experiences in the United States or in the in the UK, because the, the way of, of life in the West, on the contrary, predisposes you to a whole set of, of, of intuitive reactions which don't work in the Russian context. Uh, you have to, much of what goes on, on there is counterintuitive. And to explain its logic, you really need close ties to Russian people. And they have to be, they have to feel confident enough uh, to explain things to you and uh, uh, to engage with you and show you, you know, the, how things work in a society that's very different from your own. And of course, this has huge implications because as these sort of experts on on Russia, those who are deeply immersed in it, as many are, are no longer either able to travel or or in the country, um, what does this restrict in terms of our potential understandings of the varied mindset of the Russian population? Because they're not homogenous, you know, and it, as you say, it takes a lot of research to understand the spectrum and uh, tone of, of opinion and where that's going, but also the whole criminology, crim, criminology thing, you know, trying to understand mm -hmm. the mindset of the ruling elite, uh, which of course is different from how it was in the USSR. But if you don't have people in, in the country, it becomes even more challenging, doesn't it, to try and understand where the elite is going? Well, uh, there are two separate things here. The, the mindset of the country, the mindset of the elite, so-called elite, although to use elite for those characters, I mean, the word elite, in what sense are they elite than the, the uh, those who are in power? Uh, but uh, it has always been difficult to penetrate the Kremlin itself and to know what's going on, what the balance of forces is, who's on top, who's not, uh, what is motivating them, and that has not become easier in 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 uh, in the post-Soviet period. But what has what what it is. Uh, available if for journalists who are ready to make the effort uh, is an understanding of the society. And uh, the, if you understand the society, you, you may not know every, you may not know what Putin said to uh, Shoigu uh, today, but, or yesterday, but you'll have a better sense of the way things are moving in terms of those who rule the country than you would if you didn't know the country at all. So I think that uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, really often a question of the commitment of the Western journalist, scholar, diplomat, and uh, where the commitment exists. I have a feeling, I mean, just on the basis of circumstances, you know, just what, what little I've been able to glean from the press reports, that Evan uh, Gershkovich was one of those who really... Uh, he did a very fine piece in the Wall Street Journal on the economic consequences of the sanctions. Uh, and just shortly before he was arrested, now my impression of him is, you know, just from what I've read, that he was one of those who really did make an effort. And of course, and of course, a yeah. person, a person like that would, of course, be the you know a logical target. Of course, and that's a very sensitive area, isn't it? The resilience of the Russian economy, or the fragility rather of it. Um, that's not a, a strictly military topic, but it is a highly sensitive one to the. Well, they propaganda. can they can interpret it as a military. Yeah. They could interpret anything. They could interpret uh, supply shortages, uh, uh, problems with transport, uh, absence of spare parts, uh, economic slowdown in 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 
military uh, uh, settlements or cities, uh, anything of that kind. There's no barrier in the statute to uh, uh, to make to making such a such an interpretation. And that's what makes the defection uh, last week of actually, I think he defected earlier, but the story is only really coming out now. But the defection of a former security officer uh, from the elite guards unit that would have worked very closely with uh, sort of Putin's um, inner inner sort of security system and someone that would have seen that sort of set up and indeed the rather paranoid, shrinking para- world of, uh, of 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 Putin. I don't know if you've managed to sort of read those reports in detail. But he yes, I have. Aside. I have. I mean, this yeah, is I deeply have. fascinating. I don't know what your your take on that is. Uh, it is. It is. I mean, but he doesn't answer the main question is the potential opposition to the war. I mean, he himself was disillusioned with it. Uh, you know, he he the, it's a classic situation. I mean, the information is parceled out uh, and no one knows the whole picture. He 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 he's communicating what was uh, visible to him, uh, and we. Uh, but but uh, he's he's clearly just by uh, what I've read, it suggests to me that there are many things that he just didn't have have access to. And um, what he did say is interesting. It's useful. I mean, I don't doubt that 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 Putin is paranoid about his own life because of the the. And this is typical, by the way, in Russia, the readiness to sacrifice, uh, not just to sacrifice, but to send to certain death, hundreds of uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of of young men, you know, just beginning their lives uh, who have no real understanding of why they're fighting. Uh, That is closely connected, actually, with a hypertrophy uh, regard for his own welfare, uh, because uh, you know, legitimacy in Russia is based on power. And so the most legitimate, the most valuable is the one with the most power. Uh, there's no, you know, in their minds, there's no independent measure of value. In any case, the the revelations of, of, of this defector uh, definitely confirm that level of paranoia. And, uh, and it's perfectly plausible uh, on the basis of what's going on. But of course, it also speaks to a very large infrastructure, whether that be a security infrastructure or um, sort of um, apparatchik sort of administrative infrastructure. And going back to Tsarist times, it's extremely hierarchical, isn't it? And as you say, people know their own immediate sort of ecosystem. They know who's above them and below them, and you'll have various administrative intrigues. As long as all these people get paid, is it true to say that you will not get a significant revolt because of this this lack of sort of questioning, lack of questioning authority or people within the sort of so-called pecking order? But once you start getting people not just defecting, but if they no longer get paid on time, then this whole well that would be a factor, yeah. But the 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 re- question is: Will people in the top military and security leadership? decide enough is enough. I know from personal experience that that they are not, that that there are people in the Russian military and in the Russian security structures are no, psychologically normal and care about the country. Uh, are they in a position, and this is what we don't know, to put a stop to this? How, what will it take? They see the, the 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 senseless slaughter that's going on. It's an interesting story was told to me about Andrei Sakharov, the dissident leader in the uh, Soviet period, whom I knew rather well, actually, uh, and a con- concerning KG, KGB officer was providing information uh, to dissidents. Uh, it was actually quite a quite a uh, a famous case, uh, and if I'm not it, I, I don't want to make a mistake on his last name. I, thought, I think it was Arakov, but I have to, I have to, that has to be checked. But in any case, there was such a person. His nickname was Kletochnik, which means, which is a bar of, it was a, 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 a revolutionary pseudonym for someone who infiltrated the Tsarist police in the 19th century. In any case, uh, 
uh, people came to Sakharov and said that this guy is unreliable. That you know any guy in the in the KGB is is corrupt and uh, uh, can't be trusted. Sakharov said something very interesting. He said, "No, no, we have to believe him." He says, "There are I, I, there in the KGB. There are also decent people." So if Sakharov was willing to say that, even then, I mean, uh, I think that uh, it's it's a fair bet. And it's reasonable to make the same assumption now. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, a lot of, there is information that has reached the West, including about the apartment bombings, which is the most, this is the most important issue in the post-Soviet period. You know, because Putin came to power through an act of terror against his own people. But the, um, and there are people from the security services who provided valuable information about that. And that, that, to many people's minds, that was an outlandish conspiracy theory. I have heard many, many people who uh, are now sort of repeating that as fact and uh, are referencing it, uh, including on things like Times Radio and BBC, uh, you know, voices who, who uh, as you say, are well informed by the history and now being allowed to, to express that this was a real event, that there is enough evidence now to come to that conclusion. There was always, was enough, there was always enough ev yes. evidence, Jonathan. There was enough evidence when I first presented it 23 years ago. Uh, the uh, uh, anyone, you know, but but there's an old saying: none are so blind as those that will not see. Uh, they didn't want to see, and this includes the 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 governments of the uh, uh, U.S. and the U.K. I mean, Tony Blair uh, gave us a reception for Putin in 2003, which rival I think rivaled the Second Coming. Uh, and uh, announced to the whole world that uh, uh, this was a democratic leader. Russia was part of the West. I mean, that's what they wanted to believe. And when you want to believe something that badly, you're not going to overlook such inconvenient facts as the arrest of cage of FSB agent putting a bomb in a building in Riazan, mm. or even uh, you know raising. Uh raising Grozny to the ground. It's just an inconvenient. Well, detail. there were, I mean, there were no, there was no shortage of, of reasons uh, to not, not to, but this is the power of group thinking and it's the power of also wishful thinking. And um, uh, it had, you know, this was a war that could have been prevented, but it had, it, it had needed to be, you know, we needed in, 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 in the West, the kind of people who were willing to look at reality and to see the truth as it was. And we didn't have that. We had we had organized wishful thinking. And uh, of course, in a way, it was a replay of the appeasement complex during the 1930s. Uh, it was just too awful to think about the alternative. And again, you you mentioned this interesting sort of throwaway comment that that, uh, that sort of changes your perception of things. I mean, similarly, I spoke last week to... Uh, to Ukrainian politician, and I didn't expect him to, to, to say what he was going to say. I made a throwaway comment about the KGB or the FSB not necessarily, you know, having the sharpest pencils in the pencil case. And he said, absolutely not. He said their their recruitment process was designed to try and identify some of the brightest people in the country, not the most moral, but the brightest people. And then we got discussing on Putin. I was saying, well, he's not, he's not an intellectual. And if you read his historical paper, which I think people had read that they would be uh, far less surprised about the full scale war, but it's not a logical, consistent historical piece of work. It's a piece of tribe written by someone who is not in any way uh, sort of academically minded. Um, and this, this politician suggested that the country and he said, well, if you took the, the, the KGB's uh, normal recruitment criteria, they probably wouldn't have let Putin in. You know, he had to beg, he had to use blood and family connections. And I wonder, you know, where in that hierarchy and that system Putin was. Uh, I'm guessing that despite everyone holding him up as a master strategist, I think he was perhaps more of a low-level operative, not a strategic thinker. Well, I think you're right about that. These are products of the Soviet system. They, they you know, people who... Uh, you know, suffer, you know, what we, we had uh, immune deficiency, the HIV virus. Uh, well, their immune, their, their, their deficiency was uh, moral consciousness. 
uh, it, it atrophied to the point that it had no influence on their actions and lust for power just filled the vacuum. Uh, and that was true of a lot of people. It was true of Yeltsin too, by the way. I mean, Yeltsin was glorified in the West. He was, was no better than Putin. Uh, complete indifference toward uh, the lives of others. Uh, fixation on their own power. Uh, and, and of course, their own security. It's a sad situation, but this is what happens when you do what the communists did in Russia, which was to eliminate all normal moral values, then the population is tainted for, can be, can be tainted for generations. Generations, absolutely. And it's also the current situation has forced Putin to uh, engage in risky alliances uh, in order to keep his his power base going. You have uh, you have Kadyrov, um, you have Prigozhin, you have all sorts of unsavory characters, but you also have, say, military bloggers and so on. And, you know, we can't point to them as being an independent force as such, but certain cracks in the narrative are starting to emerge. And of course, you had the high profile, rather theatrical assassination uh, of the extremist. Um, he was a YouTuber, he was a blogger. Uh, he also messed around on the front lines, I believe. But he's one of these sort of Z propagandists. Um, yeah. Did this story surprise you at all? And is it perhaps a foretaste of chaos to come? No, it didn't. I mean, in fact, I'm surprised it took this long. I, I wrote about the uh, uh, killing of Daria Dugina uh, some months ago. And I said that, that this was the, the sign that the conflict has, has entered in a new stage. And uh, uh, the, you know, the, the people who are claiming to be responsible have been promising things like this for quite a while. Uh, so, uh, but who are they? That's what we don't know. Uh, I, you know, they claim to be an indigenous Russian movement. And by the way, they what they they what they say is is very interesting. I mean, their documents refer to Putin as a, a usurper, and refer to the 1999 terrorist bombings. Something that, of course, we in the West were. Uh, very, very anxious to uh, to ignore. Uh, I think that the, it they could be a group of Russians getting a lot of support from Ukrainian intelligence, but it's all speculation. We just don't know. We won't know unless they get caught. And the 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 organization behind it seemed to be pretty slick. Uh, there were minimal, uh, there were, nobody else died from what we can tell. So it seems to be quite well organized. Well, there were a lot of injuries, a lot of injuries. Yep. But no, no, they were trying to get one person. Uh, yeah, it was the same with the Daria Dugina. Although, you know, she, I mean, they apparently wanted to get her father. He was in a different car. So, so you could say that, but she herself was a propagandist. So it's, uh, I mean, does, does the theatricality of it, and maybe I'm reading too much into one minor detail, but you've got the organization, which is relatively slick, although obviously mistakes happen. Um, the implication that there's going to be more than one person involved, clearly, or maybe we've even got a scapegoat ready and waiting to sort of throw in front of the camera. Does it perhaps point to it being a state actor of some sort uh, behind it, say FSB, either a renegade FSB group, or even, uh, you know, trying to send a signal to the... Um, uh, you know, to the military blog community to get back in their cage and uh, uh, know their place. You know, Russia is a dark forest sometimes. And uh, uh, that's a level of speculation that uh, uh, will not lead to any conclusive result. Uh, any, you know, there are various possibilities. And... Uh, I only can guess what's going on, but I might get, and, and this is just a guess, based on Russian history and the fact that terrorist groups did emerge in Russia in the last, in the 19th century and and and, and of the early 20th century as well. The, my, my guess is that there is some sort of network inside Russia and that they're receiving help from outside. I would 
I would not bet anything on my own assessment because it's really I don't have enough enough uh we'll see we'll see how it plays out but in fact the when you speak of, the, of theatricality uh these people are well known uh the the targets are actually carefully chosen because for because they these people are not important in terms of their power uh but they but they're very visible and so striking at them is striking at in effect uh you know the idea uh and that can have an effect in russian society and uh, i think what you said is is very much echoed by uh quite a few of the russian commentators i think only ponomarev uh is really talking about a well-organized terrorist group and he's a bit of an outlier whereas michael knack and other are pointing to a an, an interesting break which is that um, the monopoly on violence is something that you cede to others at your risk. And Stalin never, you know, gave that monopoly of violence up. It was retained by the state. Putin now is relying on a number of different parties um, to inflict violence, perhaps on his behalf, perhaps not. Uh, but also that process of uh, violence on Russian soil may move out of his control entirely. It could lead to, you know, real problems within Russian society, to what extent uh, he is threatened by people like uh, Rago uh, Ragozhin and uh, Kadyrov. It's questionable because they, they, you know, they're so dependent on each other and uh, they, they would be nothing without Putin. Uh, so that's, you know, and they, the, the remarks they are, they are making publicly don't necessarily mean that they're, that they're, they're likely to take action against Putin. Action against Putin would probably come from people who are not speaking in public now, and in fact, are not even known to the outside world. Uh, but the, the the steps they've taken, the freeing of the, the convicts uh, and uh, sending them to uh, uh, to the war, uh, that uh, that's re that's destabilizing in lots of ways. I mean, first of all, it can destabilize the front because uh, ordinary soldiers, including people who've been recently mobilized, uh, don't may you know will perfectly well recognize that these people are pouring in from the prisons. But 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 beyond that, you know, those that survive, even if they're a small number, will come back to terrorize the rest of the country. Uh, they will have gone through absolute hell. Uh, they will have survived by some miracle. They will be armed. They'll they'll be, you know, totally cynical. Of course, if they weren't cynical before, they'll be even more cynical now. Uh, and they'll be and they'll be a law unto themselves. So, and there already have been such incidents in various localities in which they've terrorized local people and so, crimes as well. You know, I know in the post yeah, yeah, period absolutely. there was a lot of criminality um, and and obviously yeah. a lot of psychological disorder as well, as well as a flood of weapons in society. In Russia, we're looking at something on an absolutely different scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we can know that that we. Uh, by not stopping Putin in 1999, when it should have been stopped and could have been stopped, we bequeath to the future uh, a, a, a crisis that's unfolding now at a cost of thousands and thousands of lives and uh, with with absolutely unforeseeable consequences, future consequences. And one of those consequences, and this is this is probably the last uh, sort of question here in what is a terrifying sort of litany of questions, um, is... Putin seems to be laying the foundations for a so-called forever war. You have the sort of Generation Z inculcation in schools. Uh, you have a clear desire to create a generation who is militarized and who is brought up with the idea that uh, to embrace death for the motherland is, is acceptable and, in fact, to be wished for. Um, and to get, you know, even children from primary school age upwards used to the idea that they're going to be born into conflict. Um, whether Putin stays or not, this is a very dangerous foundation, isn't it, for the, the next generation of Russians? Indeed. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. But I don't, I'm not sure this situation can last that long. I think that... Uh, there, there, 
the 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 forces that will begin working against Putin uh, by the time those children grow up will have uh, have have laid the groundwork for a, for for a, di a different situation. Whether it'll be better or worse, I don't know, but it, I, it won't be the same in my view. I think, yeah, it's worth saying that none of his recent strategic ploys have delivered the result that he anticipated. You know, if this war was designed to protect Russia against NATO, then NATO's borders are dramatically larger than they were before. If it was to demilitarize Ukraine uh, and to, to oppose Western militarism, then that's had the opposite effect because NATO and Europe are rearming rapidly. So none of his strategic ploys seem to have really worked out. Well, and those were never the those were never the reasons for what's going on. Those were that was just uh, you know camouflage. Mm. No, it was. But I mean, the, the the terrible thing is, and it's something that people don't really understand very well, is that this is that this is basically just personal interest. And preserving, you know, greed and preserving his hold on power. And if he can, if if he if he can propagandize the Russian people with fairy tales about reestablishing the Soviet Union or the Soviet or the Russian Empire, all the better. But uh, uh, but that isn't what's what's driving this. That's not the animating factor. Mm. And and, I mean, and probably the other likelihood is, which I was speaking with a, you know the previous guest, is that again we tend to try and layer on some kind of rationality. We look at sort of you know the big geopolitical picture, and and a lot of the media still try to think of Putin as some kind of you know big thinker, rational actor, and planner. It could be that simply none of this war was his intention, and that it's just a massive mistake on his part a fatal mistake based on extremely poor information, based on people, toadies, assets in Ukraine telling him what he wanted to hear, the hierarchical machine he's built, and his own, uh, you know, his own mythologies, his own prejudices. A massive mistake, in fact, not, not a strategic uh, step at all. Well, I, it was a mistake in the sense that it didn't turn out the way he expected it to turn out. But there was no mistake in terms of his planning. Uh, you know, he intended to to bolster his popularity and bolster his hold on power. Uh, you know, with the help of uh, an invasion. I mean, he came to power with an invasion. Uh, his uh, the seizure of Crimea uh, resulted in the highest uh, popularity ratings he'd ever had, 88 percent. That lasted practically for five years and wanted to do it again. He thought it would, the, the mistake was at the level of tactics because he thought it would be easy. Um, and he was told it would be easy, which played into what he wanted to do, but that isn't what determined it. What determined it was, uh, you know, simple lust, the simple greed and lust for power of a small group of very degenerated people. I think that that's, that's a good place to sort of, um, so end this discussion. I think that's an incredibly uh, succinct summary of where we're at, and it's a good counter to all the you know big, big geopolitical arguments that you still kind of hear, um, mm -hmm. which which to me don't don't hold any water. David, it's been a huge pleasure uh, speaking once again. Um, it's a rapidly moving situation, and I look forward to catching up as uh, things unfold in the next few months. Good, thank you, thank you.